Welcome to The Practical, where we look at vascular tissue in stems and also the internal and external anatomy of leaves. First, we're going to look at the types of xylem vessels that you find in stems. We're going to look at two different types of stem. The first one is Traveller's Joy, otherwise known as Clematis vitalba. It is a wildflower which grows up and over trees and fences and walls. Therefore, the stems need to be extremely strong. To be able to see these xylem vessels, we have to break up the stems. We are going to produce what's called a macerate. And to ensure that we have a good diversity of xylem vessels in that macerate, we will add a second species. Fuchsia is the species we're also going to put in the macerate. It's an ornamental version that we will be using. But this wild version occurs in many of the hedgerows down around the south of Ireland. There is the potential for there to be a lot of debris, which is of no interest to us in the macerate. So preparing the plant material is key. Here I'm removing the smaller side shoots and I'm also going to use a vegetable peeler to remove the bark from the plant. This video was made in spring, before bud burst, but the green colour underneath the bark is a really good indicator as to whether the plant is alive. The plant is alive and it's just in its dormancy period. The clematis is also dormant right now. The clip earlier illustrated how this plant has a bit of a pest. It can actually grow up through hedges and into trees and that makes the trees top heavy, which is never a good thing in windy exposed areas. The clematis stems need extra strengthening in their stems to make sure that the stems are less likely to be damaged as they romp through their habitat. For that reason, clematis stems contain a good portion of fibre cells which run alongside the vascular tissue acting like long internal flexible scaffolding poles, making sure that the stems don't get damaged as they move up and through their growth habitat. I continued on to remove the bark from the clematis also and I cut all of the stems into one inch pieces. Although I don't show the next steps in the video, this is what I did next. I cut those smaller one inch pieces into smaller strips and then I macerated them in a Nutribullet blender. It was almost like I wood chipped them. I then made up a maceration solution of one part hydrogen peroxide, four parts deionized water and five parts glacial acetic acid. The blended plant material was then placed into the macerate solution in a big beaker and boiled at 90 degrees Celsius for seven hours on a hot plate. This treatment dissolves the lignin just enough to separate some of the cells from each other, which means that we should be able to see some of the individual xylem cells and fibre cells. But there will also be lots of rafts of undigested plant stem. I then left the macerate to cool overnight and then reduced the volume of the solution by centrifuging at 4000 RPM for six minutes. That gathered all of the cells at the bottom of the tube so I could remove the supernatant, which is the liquid above that, and replace that supernatant with deionized water. So this falcon tube is the finished macerate and it's ready for staining. As I poured the macerate plant stem into the Petri dish, the plant material can be seen. The solution looks like it contains splinters of plant debris. The larger pieces are the undigested rafts. We're interested in looking at the cells that you actually can't see with the naked eye here. Next, we need to stain the macerated plant solution so that we can see the xylem cell types and the fibres under the microscope. Much like we use hydrogen peroxide to bleach our hair blonde, the hydrogen peroxide in the macerate solution has removed any natural pigment from our macerate. So we have to use a stain to provide some contrast. I have used toluidine blue here. I left it staining for 10 minutes and then I put the Petri dish underneath a stereo microscope. A stereo microscope isn't as powerful as a normal light microscope, but it will magnify objects up to 30 times. I will use it later to look at some leaves, but first I used it to look at the contents of the Petri dish. And this is what you can see. Those rafts that we saw with the naked eye earlier are stained blue here. There is also some debris stained pink, but it's difficult to see the material because number one, the stereoscope magnification isn't powerful enough 
because these xylem vessels are very small. And number two, the material keeps moving around in the water-based solution. So what I needed to do was to make a slide and instead of using water on the slide, I just use a gel-like substance called glycerin. That keeps the xylem vessels in position so that they can be visualized under the light microscope at 400x. Making this slide is pretty easy. All I needed to do was take a drop of my macerated solution using a dropper and drop it into the middle of the drop of glycerin. I then just used the dropper to mix it up so that that water was mixed in with the glycerin. After that, it was just a case of placing on the cover slip as usual to avoid any bubbles, tidying up the slide a little bit and then visualizing it using the light microscope. Here it is magnified a hundred times using the light microscope. As I move the slide around using the stage directioner, the macerated plant stem material stays in place on the slide, allowing me to clearly visualize all the individual cells. You can see large clumps of cells that are stained a darker blue color. They are those rafts I was mentioning earlier. Those rafts are undigested cells. If we were to boil our macerate solution for longer, or indeed if we were to leave the boiled plant material in the macerate solution for longer, our plant cells would eventually be digested into their constituent parts. So there's a fine balance to be struck between how long you leave your macerate in its hydrogen peroxide and acetic acid solution and how quickly you replace that macerated solution with water to stop the digestion process. Our slide here is the best of both worlds. We have those undigested rafts so we can see how the xylem vessels and fibres are organised together in the stems. But we also have some individual xylem vessels and fibres that are digested just enough so that they appear on their own. And that allows us to see the pattern of the secondary thickening on the walls of these xylem vessels and fibres. The first type of cell I want you to notice today are these long strands that span the field of view in the microscope. They're long and they're thin. They almost look like they're hairs on the slide. They are fibre cells. From the other information provided to you, you'll hopefully know that the flexible fibre cells are long and strong because they have a secondary cell wall which is rich in lignin. Fibres can have pitted walls and because they are long, they can often be mistaken for tracheids and vice versa. To determine if these cells have pitted walls and then they could be tracheids, well, we have to zoom in a little bit further. Here they are at 400x. And when we look closer at the walls, we can see that they appear solid. Because they are long and thin and have tapered ends, we can conclude that these indeed are fibres. When we look at these cells in the video, it's always a good idea to pause the video here and there to ensure that you can see the cells in more detail. This sequence of images shows bunches of fiber cells that are not fully digested. But when you look at the edges, you can see how they're arranged next to one another. Once you can recognize the fibers, you'll be able to disregard them while you learn to recognize the xylem vessels. As you know, xylem vessels can be divided into two types. The first are tracheids, and tracheids are long and thin with pitted walls and tapered ends. Conversely, vessel elements are shorter and some are slightly thicker with tapered ends with perforation plates on each end. This is a type of xylem cell called a tracheid. Notice the tapered ends and the pits on the side walls of the cell. Upon maturity, these cells are dead and that's important because they will only transport water if the centre is hollowed out. Next, imagine hundreds of thousands of these cells bunched together in a vascular bundle in the centre of a stem. Some of the xylem in the vascular bundles that you've seen in your root and stem transverse sections would have looked like this, except you wouldn't have been able to see the sidewall pattern like you can here. This is what some of those sidewalls would have looked like. Water can move against gravity up to the middle of the cell or it can move from cell to cell laterally through the pits. These are a great example of evolutionary driven engineering, and there are millions of them effectively doing their job in even a small little tree. 
Here's a nice example of some helical or spiral secondary thickening found in the walls of xylem cells. Although these helical spirals are not the strongest of the xylem vessels, they are still stronger than the annular ring type. We have a partially digested raft of xylem cells here. And you can see another example of some of those helical thickened xylem cells at the top. Next to those on the right hand side, you have a collection of scleriform thickened xylem cells. These xylem cells are not very long, so we can tell that they're not tracheids. What you're actually seeing here is mostly a collection of shorter, thickened xylem cells called vessel elements. But at the bottom of that collection of cells, there are those thinner cells, and they are probably tracheids. So this is a nice example to show you the difference between vessel elements and tracheids. In the next part of the video, we will examine the internal and the external anatomy of plant leaves. First, I'm going to introduce you to some of the plants that we'll explore today. This is a Grisillinia littoralis hedge along the coast in Wexford. It's a common hedging plant in Ireland as it grows really quickly and it's green for privacy. And even though it's evergreen, it doesn't succumb to diseases. So the, the leaves always look brand new. We will look at the internal and external anatomy of these leaves. Notice how the top of the leaf looks slightly greener than the bottom of the leaf. Although you can't tell with the naked eye, once we take a transverse section of the leaf, you'll have a much better appreciation for why the top of the leaf that is facing the sun is a darker green colour. This plant is Camellia, and it's a shade-loving evergreen plant that produces pretty pink flowers in spring. There are actually two Camellia plants planted in here, and they're planted far too close to this Grislinia hedge. The front of my house where these are planted is baked in the sun in summer, and it isn't a suitable location for these Camellias because they prefer shadier conditions. Notice how the Camellia plant in the shade of the Grislinia hedge has nice green leaves compared to the Camellia plant situated mostly in the sun. The leaves on the non-shaded plant are yellowing and they're very stressed. This is a good example of how I am a particularly observant plant scientist but not a particularly good gardener. Perhaps I'll transplant them this year. We look at the top and the bottom surface of these ivy leaves today also and we'll see their stomata. And finally, we'll take a look at this skimia leaf to see the internal anatomy. It's a good example of how internal anatomy of leaves can vary from plant to plant. And even the 90% of plants that use C3 photosynthesis can have slightly different internal leaf anatomy. We'll start our explorations today by looking at the external anatomy of these grisillinia leaves. The different colour of the abaxal side of the leaf and the adaxal side of the leaf is readily apparent. A baxal is the lower or the bottom surface of the leaf, which is less likely to be facing the sun. And the adaxal side of the leaf is the greener side, which is more likely to be facing the sun. We'll see later how there are usually more stomata on the lower abaxal side of the leaf, because if there were lots of stomata on the top of the leaf, the plant would probably lose a lot of water very quickly. Stomatal guard cells are embedded in the epidermis. So to study the anatomy of the epidermal cells and the stomatal frequency on both the adoxal and abaxal leaf surfaces, we could just gently peel off the single cell layer of epidermis. That would also peel off the stomata. So we could just put that epidermal peel onto a slide to visualize using the light microscope. However, I use a different trick, which involves using clear nail varnish. What I do is paint the nail varnish on and let it dry. And then I just peel off the nail varnish when it is dry. When it is dry, the nail varnish will take the shape of the leaf surface. And we can then just look at the peel of nail varnish on a slide using the light microscope. Here is a skimia leaf, which I have painted with nail varnish earlier and it's now dry. All I needed to do was fold over the leaf and a small piece of nail varnish like that there will be perfect for visualizing the leaf surface under the microscope. Next, I just put a drop of water onto a clean slide, find myself a sharp blade, and I will cut away the plant material from this piece of dried nail varnish. Next, you just use a tweezers to place that into the drop of water, and then just place a cover slip on top. 
I've done this for a few different species today so that we can see the difference between the number of stomata on both surfaces of the leaves. I am sure you have examined a leaf before and I, and I know you've heard about differences in leaf veination between monocots and dicots in your lectures. This is a three-year-old dicot leadness avocado plant which I grew from an avocado seed and it has nice large leaves so the veins are easier to see so it's a nice example to use. The main vein is here and the main vein contains the continuation of those vascular bundles that you saw in the transverse section of the PTO. This main vein then branches into smaller lateral veins and then those lateral veins branch further into smaller veins again and those smaller veins won't be visible with the naked eye here. After enough branching, every leaf cell in the leaf has a vascular bundle nearby. On smaller leaves, it is usually this main vein that you will try to get a section of, so you can see the vascular bundle arrangement. Of course, we'll also cut through many of the lateral veins and also the side branched veins of those lateral veins, so you'll be able to see some of those in the transverse section of the leaf. Often when you look at the abaxal side of the leaf, it's actually much easier to see those veins. A low magnification stereoscope is useful for magnifying leaves so you can see the veins. This objective lens has three settings, 1x, 2x and 3x, which in combination with the 10x lens in the eyepiece will magnify items at 10x, 20x or 30x times. So it's a much lower magnification than our light microscopes. This is the Grisilinia PTO visualised on the stereoscope. Let's follow the path of the PTO and then the main vein up the leaf. The main vein runs the entire length of the leaf, but it branches off laterally left and right, and then those lateral branches divide again. Observe our transverse section of the leaf, we should be able to see the main vein and then also the smaller regularly occurring lateral veins either side of the main vein. By now, we're all very well versed in what we need to prepare good plant sections. Number one is to use the sharpest blade you can find. And number two is to take lots of thin sections. It's always a good idea to include the main vein as part of your transverse section because the vascular bundles of xylem phloem and vascular cambium are actually clearest in the main vein. I prepared a few leaf sections from different species in the same way. And I placed all of the thin sections into water in a petri dish for five minutes. Although I had stored the leaves in a pre-dampened plastic bag, I wanted to make sure that the cells were all very well hydrated by the time we got to visualise them on the slide. Taking thin samples will also make sure that the leaf sections sit in the right orientation on the slide. We want to look down at the cut edge, not at the surface of the leaf or at the underside of the leaf. So the thinner the section, the more likely the leaf section will end up sitting with the cut side down. We won't use stain on these leaves because leaves have plenty of natural pigment and that pigment will provide lots of contrast. I simply need to just place a drop of water on the slide and then choose the thinnest sections for the slide. The thinner the section, the more light from the microscope can penetrate the section and so the clearer our picture will be. A cover slip placed on top then just completes the preparation. To show you the difference in leaf anatomy between monocots and dicots, I also took a leaf transverse section from this dragon tree plant. And I also prepared a nail varnish epidermal print to show you the stomatal arrangement. Almost all monocots have parallel veins. And when you look at this dragon plant leaf under the stereoscope, those parallel leaves are quite clear. We will start our internal leaf anatomy explorations using this Grisilinia leaf section. The sun side and the shade side of the leaf is labelled. And you can immediately see why the sun side of the leaf is greener. The concentration of the green pigment is much higher in the shoe located on the adaxal side of the leaf. 
This is the mid vein containing the vascular bundles. And as we move left on the transverse section of the leaf, you can see where we've cut through some of those lateral veins. Here's a small one here, and there's a larger one over here. Here is a photo of the main vein of a grizzlinia leaf. Let me talk you through the tissues in the leaf. Let's explore the vein first. These are the xylem cells and they are easily recognisable from their large pores for conducting water. These are the phloem cells. And in between the xylem and the phloem is the vascular cambium. And surrounding the vascular bundle on each side are these cells called bundle sheet cells. In C3 plants like Grizzlinia, the bundle sheet cells prevent air entering the xylem. And it's thought that they also have a role in storing water to help control surges and pressure as a result of opening and closing the stomata, especially in plants in dry tropical climates. The next tissue I want you to meet is the palisade layer cells. These are longer, almost rectangular cells packed tightly together and they lie just under the upy epidermis on the sun side of the leaf. These palisade cells are rich in chloroplast, and that explains why the sun side of the leaf appears darker. It makes good sense to pack these cells with chloroplast so that the chlorophylls and the other photosynthetic pigments in these palisade cells can harvest as much light as possible. Under the palisade layer is another tissue called a spongy mesophyll layer. This layer does indeed appear spongy. There are lots of air spaces between the cells, allowing oxygen to diffuse out of the leaf and for carbon dioxide to pass quickly into the palisade layer cells. You can appreciate that even if the stomata are enclosed on hot days or days when humidity is low, there is still a certain amount of CO2 that can be stored in here temporarily so that photosynthesis can continue, at least for a short while, until the stomata open again. The mesophyll cells can also photosynthesize, but in this particular species, at this time of year, the density of chloroplasts in here is not as high as it is in the palisade layer. Finally, before we examine another leaf section, let's look at the upper epidermis. Some of the more observant members of the class might have noticed that grizzlinia appears to have yellow veins. Here you can see that the outer wall of the single-celled upy epidermis, where the cuticle is located, is rich in waxes and that is probably what is giving the veins their yellow appearance. That hydrophobic cuticle helps to slow down water loss from the plant. And if you look closely, you'll see that the lower epidermis also has that waxy cuticle on its lower epidermal layer. When I'm teaching plant anatomy, I always tell my students that what I'm teaching is just the typical tissues that you might expect to find, for example, in leaves. However, there's a great deal of diversity when it comes to the tissues that you might find. This is a transverse section of the skimia leaf, and skimia is a dicot, so there's just one single vascular bundle here in this midrib. I'll point out all the leaf tissues that we've seen in our previous Grislinia example, and then I'll add a couple more. There is the epidermal layer, and there's the palisade layer. Underneath that, you have the spongy mesophyll. Although the spongy mesophyll is a lot larger in this particular leaf. Let's migrate into the mid vein now. Here are the bundle sheet cells. Here are the xylem. The vascular cambium and then the phloem. Underneath that you have another set of bundle sheet cells. There's an extra really obvious tissue both under and over the mid vein. These are pillars of calenchyma. You would have seen these strong regions just under the epidermis of the celery petiole. Here they're situated under the epidermis as well. They have thick primary cell walls reinforced with a high proportion of cellulose. And there's a smaller pillar of this calenchyma at the top, but a much broader and larger strand on the shade side of the vascular bundle. Calenchyma tissue in evergreen leaves is quite common as it gives the leaf the strength to persist in all weathers and in many seasons. Let's look at the dragon tree leaf now. This is a monocot and it had parallel veins. When you visualise the TS of the, of the dragon tree leaf, you can see that the centralised veins are not present. 
but instead you have a scattering of veins. Here's that same section of the dragging tree leaf, but this time it's been stained with toluidine blue. The veins have stained really well here, so they're much easier to visualise. Here's a photo of the spongy mesophyll of the dragging tree leaf. Notice these crystals in the cells. In lectures we talked about the ability of certain cell vacuoles to accumulate druse and raphide crystals. Here is one. And some of the cell vacuoles are packed full of these crystals. Those crystals consist of calcium oxalate and it's thought that they act as a storage reservoir for calcium and might also be functioning in toxic waste storage. Now that we have a good understanding of the tissue types you are likely to find in leaves and where in the leaves those tissue types occur, let's explore the topography of the upper and lower leaf surface. As we know, this leaf tissue is surrounded by a single layer of cells called the epidermis and most plants have a cuticle incorporated into the epidermis. Other really important structures embedded in the epidermis are the stomata. This is a photo of the abaxal surface of a grizzlinia. And these are the stomata. A stomata is a pore consisting of two cells called guard cells. And these guard cells can inflate and deflate by simply changing the volume of water in the cell vacuole. When the vacuoles are full, the cells are turgid, causing the guard cells to bend laterally. And this bending opens a space between the middle of the two cells. This is called the stomatal pore, and it's the entry point for carbon dioxide for photosynthesis and the exit route for oxygen and water vapour via the transpiration stream. When the cell vacuoles start to empty and the guard cells lose their turgidity, the two cells relax and they move closer to one another. And this has the effect of closing the pore, which in effect seals the leaf. Earlier I showed you how I prepared nail varnish leaf impressions. I've done this for a few species and I've taken leaf impressions both of the upper and the lower surfaces so you can see the difference in stomatal frequency on each surface. This is a nail varnish impression of the upper surface of our grizzlinia leaf. There are hardly any stomata on there. What you think might be stomata is just the pattern of the epidermal cells. But let's look at the nail varnish impression of the underside of the leaf. There is such a contrast. There are so many more stomata under there. And the impression of the guard cells are clear to see along with a few open ones. We should remember that Grizzlinia is a dicotyledonous plant and the scattered stomata on the leaves of the dicots just like this one is readily apparent. Another dicotyledonous plant is ivy. Here is a photo of the upper surface of an ivy leaf. There are a few stomata dotted around the upper surface and their epidermal cells have sort of a jigsaw pattern. However, look at the underside of this leaf. The frequency of the stomata on the underside of the leaf is much higher. You can also see that typical kidney-shaped guard cell that you find in dicot plants. Here we have seen two species where stomatal frequency was higher on the lower leaf surface. There are a multitude of dicot plants where that is indeed the general rule. However, there's always exceptions. Plants that live on water are one exception. This is duckweed, which is the smallest flowering plant known to science. Duckweed has its stomata on the upper leaf surface because if they were on the lower leaf surface they'd be sitting in the water and gaseous exchange would be very difficult. Duckweed is another example of a plant that has lots of air and chyma to ensure that it has adequate amount of oxygen available to the plant for respiration. So far we've been examining the kidney shaped guard cells that make up the stomatal complex of dicotyledonous plants. The stomata in monocotyledonous plants, like the grasses, and my trusty dragon tree houseplant, are slightly different. Here's the nail varnish impression of the dragon tree stomata. The stomata appear in ordered files, and they have a shape that resembles a dumbbell rather than a kidney. Guard cells of monocots are also flanked by subsidiary cells. Here's a nail varnish impression of the stomata of perennial ryegrass. You can see a similar single file arrangement of stomata on the leaves here as well. The subsidiary cells are also a little bit easier to see here. Thank you for watching the video. I really hope that it helps you visualise plant anatomy, both internal and external, a little bit more clearly.
And I hope especially it will help you to do really well in your tasks, in your practical. Best of luck.